To talk about quantum computers, I first need to talk about regular computers because we're going to borrow a lot of the, the jargon and words and concepts from the regular computing world and then extend them into the weird and wonderful and wacky quantum world. So uh, everything on you do on a computer, uh, everything you ask a computer to do from uh, run a complex calculation to, to watch this YouTube video, uh, to do to type on your word processor, to do everything anything gets translated into long strings of numbers. And then it's by manipulating these numbers and, and adding them and comparing them and shifting them and doing all sorts of things that the computer does what you want it to do. Now, for various reasons, computers don't represent numbers the same way that we represent numbers, you know, with like one, two, three, four, on and on like that. Instead, computers use a binary system where numbers are either zero or one, either off, which is zero, or on, which is one. And so everything, and I mean everything that you do with a computer, gets translated into these ones and zeros, which we call bits. Now, these bits need to be stored in a memory. Like this is where uh, the computer stores what you want it to do. And so there are memory banks uh, filled with electricity. And if a little bit of it is filled with electricity, that little bit represents a one. And then if it's empty, it represents a zero. And so the size of your memory limits the size of the computation that you can perform. If you have one bit and one bit only, you can only represent on or off, two possible states in one of those two possible states. That's it. You can't represent anything else. If you have two bits, then you can represent four possible states. You can have zero and zero, one and one, one and zero, or zero and one. And then you can extend this. So if you have 10 bits or 20 bits or 100 bits or 1,000 bits, you can represent one of many states. Now, to do more complex calculations, you don't just want all your memory dedicated to a one possible value among many. So you chop up your memory into segments and you have this little segment represents one number or letter or concept. And then you have another chunk of memory that represents something else. And then another chunk of memory and another chunk of memory and that, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. I think you get your point. But the fundamental chunk size that represents how many different values you can possibly represent. But each chunk will only represent one value at a time, one concept combination of ones and zeros. Then you take the bits that are stored in memory and you shove them through what are called logic gates, which do various things to the ones and zeros. This is a very simplified discussion of computing. These logic gates combine the ones and zeros or compare them or do interesting or reverse them or just do all sorts of things. So there are different kinds of logic gates. And to tie everything together, you write what is called an algorithm, which is you assign certain values to memory. You send these memory values, the values, those bits, you send them through the logic gates, and then you end up with a result. And the algorithm tells the computer which bits to send through which logic gates when. Again, this is a very, very simplified overview of computing. But that's, that's basically it. You've got your bits, you've got your memory, you've got your logic gates, and you've got your algorithms, and you get to do all the wonderful things that computers do. Now, when we switch into quantum computers, the one of the powers of quantum computing and why computing and why it's so much more powerful in certain cases than regular computers is through this wonderful concept. And by wonderful, I mean very, very difficult to understand called superposition. Remember when I was talking about those bits and how it can either be on or off, like you have a little bit of uh, a little uh, segment of memory and it's either filled with electricity or it's not, it represents one of two possible states. Well, quantum superposition is this concept that only arises in subatomic systems and only in specially pre uh, prepared quantum systems is this idea that quantum systems don't represent one of two possible states, they represent both states simultaneously.
A quantum bit or qubit isn't one or zero, it is a complex combination of both one and zero at the same time. What this does, the translation from bit to qubit, is that it dramatically increases the power of the computation. So for example, if I have one bit, I can represent only one value, one or zero. If I have one qubit, I can represent two values. I can represent one and zero at the same time. And I can perform calculations on both values at the same time. If I have two regular bits, I can still only represent one value at a time. It's either zero, 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 one, one, zero, or one, one. I only get to pick one of those four. But if I have two qubits, I get to represent all four values at the same time. I'm getting more bang for my buck by taking advantage of this quantum superposition. If I have 10 bits, then I can represent just one value. But if I have 10 qubits, I can represent two to the 10 possible values. That's over a thousand different values at once, a thousand different combinations at once simultaneously with only 10 qubits. And then with as few as like 100 qubits, you are able to access more states, more possibilities than even our most powerful computers. And in fact, I think it's even lower, like at like 60 qubits or something. It's, it's, it, it can represent more memory, more states than even our most powerful computers. So that's one of the allures of quantum computing is that by taking advantage of this superposition, you get access to much, much more powerful computing than if you did with just regular bits. But there's more to computing than just the memory or the bits, you also need the logic gates. The logic gates in a quantum computer have to be very, very special. And they have to be very special because they have to maintain this superposition state. In quantum mechanics, the superposition, this like complex combination of all possible states, breaks down when you actually go to take a measurement, or if there's an interaction, or there's something that disturbs the state. The superposition collapses and reduces to one possible value. So when you send qubits through their quantum logic gates, you can't mess with the superposition. You can't mess with this very special quantum property. You have to do it very carefully. And so there's a limited number of quantum logic gates that allow you to do this, but they exist. And there's enough of them that you can string them together to make generic algorithms. And this is the last piece of the puzzle. You know, remember with computing, you have memory, you have logic gates, and you have algorithms. With quantum computing, you have quantum memory or quantum bits, you have quantum logic gates, and now you have quantum algorithms. And the quantum algorithms are going to take advantage of another very useful property of quantum systems, which is entanglement. The reason we want to take advantage of entanglement is that these qubits, however many you have, whether it's just a couple or like a bunch, However many qubits you have, you are going to perform, or your quantum computer is going to perform all possible solutions at once. It's going to examine all possible variations at once. So unlike a regular computer where you program the memory with certain values, you, al you algorithmically decide where these values go so that you get the right answer. Instead, with a quantum computer, you just load up the qubits. They have all possible values. They all go through the quantum logic gates, and then all possible answers come out at the same time. That's through that superposition principle. Because all qubits contain all possible values, you end up with all possible answers. But we don't want all possible answers. We only want the right answer. We want our computer to actually deliver a result. Like if our computer just delivered all possible results, even the wrong ones, that wouldn't be very useful. So we're going to take advantage in our quantum algorithms of entanglement. Quantum entanglement is when one qubit can talk to another qubit, or one qubit can affect another qubit, or the state of one qubit 
can affect the state of another qubit. In fact, you can entangle all the qubits together so that if you fiddle with one, if one of them goes through a quantum logic gate, then there are, I'm using a lot of metaphors here, a ripple effects where the other qubits also respond. And so the job of a quantum algorithm is to take all possible starting states, pass them very, very cleverly through the quantum logic gates, and at the end, because of the entanglement, because there is communication, you want all the wrong answers to disappear, to be erased, and then only the right answer survives at the end of the algorithm. That is the purpose of the quantum algorithm, to take all possible states, all possible commutations, uh, all possible common ideas, you know, everything, use this entanglement property, and then end up with only the right answer at the end. As you can imagine, this is not an easy thing. There are not that many known quantum algorithms, you know, around 50 or so known quantum algorithms. Com quantum computers are not going to be able to solve every kind of problem that a regular computer can solve any faster than a regular computer. It's only in a certain limited set of cases where a quantum com computer becomes so much better than a classical computer. And there's a few different kinds of algorithms like uh, trying to factor, uh, find the factors of very large numbers, uh, trying to do searches in very large uh, search spaces, uh, you know, to name a couple examples where classical computers take a really, really long time to find those answers, but a quantum computer can explore all possible answers at once and then in a sense converge on the correct answer in a very, very fast amount of time. We care about this and they, they gained a lot of interest back in the 90s. Uh, you know, quantum computer algorithms and ideas have been around for decades, but it was back in the 90s when um, mathematician Peter Shore discovered a quantum algorithm that can factor large numbers very, very quickly, which is handy because we depend on the fact that classical computers have a really, really bad time with this problem, with factoring large numbers, to provide the backbone of our encryption schemes. So <laughs> if you have a device that can actually crack encryption, encryption schemes very, very quickly because they can factor large numbers very, very easily, that's going to be an issue. And voila, a lot of people became very, very interested in this. And quantum computing exploded in the 90s and early 2000s. Now, building a quantum computer is much, much easier, or much more difficult, sorry, than thinking of a quantum computer. And that's because it's really, really hard to build quantum systems that can survive throughout the, comp the computation. These quantum systems that with, with the superposition and the entanglement, you know, all the juicy stuff of quantum mechanics that we're using to, to power our computation are very, very fragile. Quantum states are very, very fragile things. So if the quantum computer gets too warm or if someone like kicks it really hard, the superposition, the entanglement can fail. It can, it can destroy itself. And then instead of delivering the correct answer at the end of the algorithm, it just spits out useless junk. We say that this quantum system decoheres. It, it just loses all that special quantum stuff that we need it in order to have a quantum computer. And so this limits the quantum computers that we can actually build today. Because we can't just have as many qubits as we want. We need to actually devise physical systems, either with like lasers or ions that are trapped in a grid or like whatever. We need actual systems that can become in this superposition state, become entangled with their fellow qubits, and then pass them through logic gates and actually do the physical mechanisms on them to get the result at the end of the day. We are currently building quantum computers. A bunch of companies are interested. At the time of the recording, I believe the most powerful quantum computer that I described, there are other approaches to quantum computing that, you know, that's a subject of another video. There are other, with this approach to quantum computing, 
Uh, we have something like 53 qubits is our largest system, which is a lot. That's, that's actually a very, very large quantum computer. But it's not incredibly powerful because you can't run a lot of steps on it. You can't pass them through logic gates very, very often uh, until a, it just gets too warm or too shaky or too uncertain. And you're not guaranteed of a good result at the end. You, you get increase the chances of getting a junk result. So that limits what we can do. The hunt is on to build a supercomputer that is, or sorry, a quantum computer that is more powerful and capable of doing things that even our most powerful supercomputers can't in any reasonable amount of time. We're not quite there yet, but it's only, well, a matter of time before we develop the needed technology. Will this revolutionize the world? Kinda, sorta, maybe not, but not really. Quantum computers don't solve every kind of problem better than a classical computer. It's only a certain set of algorithms that are superior. But in the end of the day, they will complement our classical computers, our super, our super computers. They will provide a niche. And, and we're also going to have to think of better encryption schemes. Uh, thank you so much for watching. Please go to patreon.com slash pmsutter to keep these shows going. I really, really do appreciate it. And like, share, and subscribe. Feel free to share. And I will see you next week.